Faithful living in them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for favorable weather, for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, and for peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for those who travel by sea, air, and land, for the sick, the suffering, the captive, and for their salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord from all affliction, wrath, and need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord mercy. Protect us, save us, have mercy on us, and preserve us, O God, by your grace. Lord have mercy. Commemorating our most holy, most pure, most blessed, and glorious Lady, the Theotokos and ever Virgin Mary, with all the saints, let us commit ourselves and one another and our whole life to Christ our God. Without a 
According to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly charged them, See that no one knows it. But they went away and spread his fame through all that district. As they were going away, behold, a dumb demoniac was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the dumb man spoke. And the crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything like this seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He casts out demons by the prince of demons. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogue, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every infirmity. Glory to you. something that we cry out often in, in a prayer through the liturgy is asking God, asking Jesus, asking the Lord for mercy. Lord have mercy. In this case, Son of David. Jesus is the King of David who will reign on the throne forever. It's a title for Jesus. But we ask God to have mercy on us. And of course, as you know, mercy is much broader than mere forgiveness. It comes from a word that has to do with anointing and healing. And they cry out to Jesus. Have mercy on us, son of David. And he asked them, do you think I can heal you? Do you think I can do this? So their response is important as well. They respond, yes, Lord. 
Yes, Lord. So it's up to us when, when Jesus wants to heal and deliver us to cooperate with that grace, to say, yes, Lord. And there's an interesting point about, a minor point about, why are there two blind men? Well, of course, there are two blind men because there were two blind men. But as the fathers of the church understood it, in an allegorical sense, the blind men, the fathers, right, may have represented the, the Jews in the kingdom of Israel in the north and Judah in the south, the two kingdoms, that, that they were blind and didn't see the Messiah. And other fathers would say it represents the Jews and all of us, unless some of you have Jewish background, all of us who are Gentiles. It represents the Jews and the Gentiles. All people need to be healed of spiritual blindness. And it's kind of odd that when Jesus heals them and tells them something, don't tell anyone about this, what do they do? Man, if I was healed, I think I'd say, well, whatever that guy says goes with me. And they run around telling people about it. Well, St. John Chrysostom, of course, the author of the liturgy that we're praying, he has a take on it that I hadn't heard before. He describes these two formerly blind persons as preachers and evangelists. Here's what he writes about this part of the gospel. It teaches us that we should say nothing about ourselves. If the glory would be offered up to God, not only should we not prevent this, but that we should even command that it be done. So he sees this consistent where when Jesus tells some people, go tell, tell for the glory of God what has happened, he says the point is, Jesus is setting an example about, hey, don't, it's not about me, uh, but the glory of God. When it's about the glory of God, that should be told. I'd like to focus on the last verse of today's gospel, verse 35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. You may remember me asking you this question before, but what did Christ, the apostles, and the early disciples preach more than anything? More than any message, what is the charisma? What is the gospel message if you had to boil it down into one phrase? Because there are a lot of things that are true. It is true that God loves us unconditionally. But that's not what Christ and the apostles preached most of all. There is forgiveness of sins, and that's true, but that's not what they preached more than anything else. They preached repentance, and we do need to repent, but that's not what they preached more than anything else. More than anything else, when you read the scriptures, not only during the life of Christ, but in the book of Acts, they preached the kingdom of God, the good news of the kingdom, the kingdom of God. Now, oftentimes it's shortened to the kingdom because they were reluctant to say God, so the kingdom is shorthand for the kingdom of God. So for us, in 2022 in the United States, what does it mean to have a king or to live in a kingdom? I touched upon this briefly before because I've had to reflect on it. It's, it's not something we naturally relate to when you, when you grew up in a, in a democratic republic. But it's all over scripture, all over the liturgy, all over our tradition. Obviously it's in the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. The kingdom and the will are related, but they're not exactly the same. But that's what we pray in every Lord's Prayer, in our personal prayer and our prayer together. In our liturgy, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. But what's the first thing? The kingdom. In the Panachitas, we pray for the deceased. We refer to Christ as the immortal king and our God. And although you may not hear it, when the deacon, when I approach for Holy Communion, 
because a deacon doesn't take communion, a deacon receives communion like you do. I pray, I say to the priest, don't pray, but I say, um, Reverend Father, behold, I approach the immortal King and our God. Reverend Father, give me the precious blood of our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ. But behold, I approach the immortal King and our God. So that is throughout our, our liturgy. He is King. And in the liturgy of the hours, if you ever pray some of those, it's Christ, our King and God, before whom we bow. Of course, in our common prayers too, we call the Holy Spirit, what's the title for the Holy Spirit we use? Heavenly King. So this idea of king is throughout the scriptures. So what kind of, how does a king work for us? Let me offer a few things to think about. A king's will is known and pervasive. And I'm talking about a secular kingdom throughout history, as well as hopefully the kingdom of God for us. But a king's will is known. What the king wants is known throughout the kingdom. So it's known and everybody knows it. That's what the king wants. Similar, uh, for example, when um, when the uh, the Hebrew children and, and Daniel and others defied the king's will, it was because the king's will was known everywhere. And it was expected that we would obey. When a king orders, obedience is expected. Kind of a, kind of, not kind of. That applies to the kingdom of God as well. Obedience is expected. Yet we have free will. God will not force us to follow him or force us to obey. But that is what is being a, a child, a son or daughter in the kingdom is about. If you look at the Old Testament, it has to do when God says move, you move. When he says don't, you don't. Remember when Israel was being led through the uh, wilderness? There was a, a cloud by day and a fire by night. And they were told... If it stays, you stay. God's saying stay. If it moves, you move. Sometimes in my life, I want to move when God is not telling me to move. Sometimes I want to stay when he's telling me to move, because maybe I'm more comfortable and complacent here. But being in a kingdom means we're looking at the fire and looking at the cloud. When it's time to move, it's time to move. When it's time to stay, it's time to stay. Psalm 123, verse 2 says, The eyes of servants look to the hand of their master. And Christ is also called master. Of course, the king, in a secular sense, the king is the utmost master. Servants, handmaids, would look to the king, or the, the queen, uh, they would look to them, and with emotion, the, they're watching, paying attention. The, the king didn't have to spell everything out. Okay, I've got to give you the Ten Commandments every time. They're looking for a motion, a gesture, to say, what does the king need? What does the king desire? And that ought to be us, having our eyes fixed on the king, fixed on his hand. When he says something, we're anticipating, what does Jesus Christ, the king, want me to do? And when he moves me, maybe even without a word, I'm moving. Sometimes we also forget that kings in the Old Testament were warriors. They were warrior kings. Kings fought for their people. They went out and led them in battle. It wasn't like you know, some medieval kings fought. But in later times, sometimes kings sat back and sent everybody else out. But the kings in the Old Testament went out and fought for their people. And when they didn't, it wasn't a good time. When David messed up and said, oh, I'm going to send them out and hang around home, that's when the Bathsheba thing, and it became a mess. Kings are warrior kings, meant to fight for their people. And that's exactly what Jesus does. He fulfills that Old Testament role of a warrior king who fights for his people. When I was on retreat earlier this summer, um, Bishop Scott McKay addressed Jesus as the Lion of Judah. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Lions are pretty ferocious. And he pointed out that sometimes we treat Jesus like a house cat that needs to be managed instead of a lion. 
<laughs> and he acknowledged, even as a bishop, sometimes bishops want to treat the Lion of Judah like a house cat to be managed. The king is not to be managed. The king is the manager. We are the ones to be managed. Do we reflect on Christ the king and realize he's a warrior king? He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. Who is on the throne of your life? Years ago there was a, a speaker, an author, and he had a little booklet. In that booklet he had a diagram of the throne. Kind of stick figures, right? Diagram of the throne. And he said, who's on the throne of your life? And if you're just living the way unbelievers live, we're on the throne, right? We put ourselves on the throne. What, what do I want? We put ourselves on the throne. But he said, if you are a Christian, if you're a disciple of Jesus, Christ is on the throne. So he, he draws the diagram and shows self on the throne. Then he draws another one, Christ on the throne. Is Christ on the throne of our lives and our hearts all the time? In, in moments of fervor, I put Christ fully on the throne. And I think, wow, that's where he belongs, on the throne. And I think, eh, maybe, maybe I'll climb up there with him. Put myself on the throne next to Christ. And pretty soon it's like, maybe it's like, well, well Jesus, I, I, I'm good. You can, you can step down. I, I got it. I got it from here. And what happens? I'm back on the throne. If that ever happens to you like it happens to me, that's why we have the sacrament of confession. We all do that. But the reminder to us is, who's the king? Who's on the throne? What influences you more? That tells you what kingdom you're in. What influences you more? Twitter or the Bible? Your favorite news source or sacred scripture? Or maybe it's your favorite blogger or the readings of the fathers of the church and the saints. What rules and reigns in your life? And the funny thing is about preaching a homily is I've heard this homily several times preparing it, and it convicts me too. I have to, what rules in my life? Money, pleasure, esteem, popularity. There are lots of things that I and you can put before Christ. And I'll, usually we don't do that intentionally. It kind of kind of creeps up on us. Maybe you look at your economic statement in these times and think, oh my. You know, we saved for retirement, took a big hit. Well, it's okay. Our trust isn't in our 401ks. Maybe things we plan to do, we can no longer do. COVID hits, health issues hit, all kinds of things happen. But Jesus Christ is still on the throne. What about our vehicles? Who do they belong to? I mean, they're registered to us, right? But when I retired, I got to get that pickup that I wanted for years. I mean, I couldn't wait till I could get a Ford F-150, four-wheel drive, full cab, everything, right? My name's on the registration. Who does that belong to? If Jesus is the king, are our vehicles, our cars, our trucks, our motorcycles, whatever we have, our boats, planes, are they at the service of the kingdom? So when someone says, oh, can I borrow your truck? Or when you have a truck, everyone wants to help you move. Can you help me move? It tests me. It, it's got to be at the service of the kingdom, even though many times I just want to think, man, I've saved for this truck and I'm retired. It's my truck. But that truck, our home, our financial resources, should all be at the service of the king of kings. Elijah, or St. Elias, who we commemorated this past week and after Divine Liturgy, we'll have the blessing of the vehicles. God provided the vehicle, the chariot of fire. God gives us the vehicles. He provides. They belong to him. So as, as our, if you brought a vehicle to be blessed, part of that blessing, yeah, will God bless and protect you as you travel around? Amen, yes. But also remember that that vehicle is at the service of the king. We are beloved sons and daughters of a king. We're beloved sons and daughters of the king. 
What does that make us? That makes us a royal family. You're a member of a royal family. We need to live like that then. So often, I, I, I live on a level that's not, I don't live like I'm part of a royal family, but I am, so are you. We need to live that way. That is our fundamental identity, being sons and daughters of God, more than, you know, more than anything else about us. Being a son or a daughter of the king is our dignity, and it's our destiny. So my prayer for you and for I is that we will live like that. Live as members of the royal family until the king returns or we go to meet the king. And for all, in all, may God be given the glory. God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Let us all say with our whole soul and with our whole mind, let us say... Lord, have mercy. O Lord Almighty God of our fathers, we pray you here and have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your great mercy, we pray you here and have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Francis, Pope of Rome, our most reverend Metropolitan William, for those who serve and have served in this holy church, for our spiritual fathers, and for all our brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, have mercy.
of the true faith, always, now, and ever, and forever. May the Lord God remember his kingdom, our Holy Father, Francis, Pope of Rome, our most reverend Metropolitan, uh, William, the Venerable Presbyter, the Diaconate of Christ, the minor orders, the monastic order, our civil authorities, all the armed forces, and all the service of our country, the noble, ever-memorable founders and benefactors of this holy church. May the Lord God remember his kingdom, all you Christians of the true faith, always, now, and ever, and forever. Precious gifts placed before us, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. O Lord God Almighty, who in our holy receive the sacrifice of praise from those who call upon you with their whole heart, accept also the prayer of us sinners, bring us to your holy altar, enable us to offer you gifts and spiritual sacrifices for our sin and for the people's failings. Make us worthy to find favor in your sight that our sacrifice may be pleasing to you. For the good spirit of your grace may rest on us on these gifts here present and on all your people. Grant this to the mercies of your only begotten Son with whom you are blessed, together with our holy, good, life fitting spirit now and ever and forever. Amen.
us stand in awe. Let us be attentive to offer the holy anaphora in peace. Mercy, peace, a sacrifice of grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, through the love of God and Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, be with all of you. And with your Always and every prayer. We praise you. 
holy, peaceful, and without sin, let us beseech the Lord. Grant this, O Lord. Grant the angel of peace, a faithful guide and guardian of our souls and bodies, let us beseech the Lord. Grant this, O Lord. And the pardon and remission of our sins and offenses, let us beseech the Lord. Grant this, O Lord. For what is good and beneficial to our souls and for peace in the world, let us beseech the Lord. Peace and repentance, let us beseech the Lord. Grant this, O Lord. For a Christian, painless, unashamed, peaceful end of our life, and for a good account before the fearsome judgment seat of Christ, let us beseech the Lord. Grant this, O Lord. Asking for unity in the faith and for communion of the Holy Spirit, let us commit ourselves and one another and our whole life to Christ our God.
person's body, whether God and Savior Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin and for life everlasting. Amen. I, priest Anthony, partake of the precious body of Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, for the remission of my sins and for life everlasting. Amen. O Lord, I believe and profess that you are the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who came into the world to save sinners, and who will reign with the first. Accept me today for the time of years, and you shall suffer, O Son of God. For I will not reveal this mystery to your enemies, nor will I give you the gifts of sex to Jesus, but I give thee a high profession. Remember me, O Lord, when you come into your kingdom. Remember me, O Master, when you come into your kingdom. Remember me, O Lord, when you come into your kingdom. May the partaking of your holy mysteries, O Lord, be not a great judgment for condemnation. But for the healing of the soul of the prophet, O Lord, I also believe and profess that this is in my heart to be sweet. This is truly your most precious body and your life giving blood, which I have prayed that you would really receive for the remission of all my sins and for my life everlasting. Amen. O God, be merciful to me, the sinner. O God, praise me in my sins and my first sin. O Lord, forgive me for I sin without number. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, from the heavens, praise Him in the highest, praise Him in the highest, Approach with fear of God and with faith. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Lord is God and has revealed himself to us. We give our love to you.
have mercy on us and save us through the prayers of His Most Pure Mother, the Ever Virgin Theotokos, and uh, through the prayers <clears throat> of the holy martyrs and Boris and Gleb and Romanos and David and Christina the Martyr, and through the prayers of our Holy Father among the saints, Basil the Great Archbishop of Cesare and Cappadocia, Patron of this Holy Church, and through the prayers of all the saints, be Christ have mercy on us and save us for His good. And he loves mankind. Amen. Let us pray to the Lord. Traveled on the winds of the wind. You sent to your servant Elijah a fire chariot as a means of giving convenience. You guide men to invent them of all these cars, which are as fast as the wind, therefore, O Lord, pour down upon them your heavenly blessing, and grant that them a guardian and angel, that they may God be guided by upon the rightful road and be preserved against all harm. Enable those who ride in these vehicles to arrive safely at their destination. For your inevitable providence, you are the provider of all things, and to you be your glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever and forever. Amen. So at the end of this prayer, uh, then we will sing, Now you may dismiss the servant. And then let's just start going out there. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. O Master, Lord our God, hearken unto the prayer which we now send up to you, and bless these vehicles with your right hand, and send down upon them your guardian angel, that all who desire to journey therein may be safely preserved and shielded from every evil purpose. And like the Ethiopian eunuch riding in the chariot and reading of your holy prophecy was granted faith and grace through the Apostle Philip, so now manifest the path of salvation to your servants who shall travel in these conveyances, that with your helping grace they may be clothed upon with good works and after the completion of this life may be granted everlasting joy in your heavenly kingdom. For yours is the might, the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. And unto you do we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever, and forever. Amen. These automobiles will be blessed, are blessed by the sprinkling of this holy water, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.